The world operates on a foundation most of us never even see. A foundation built on agreements, alliances, and yes, even currencies. For decades, the US dollar has reigned supreme, fueled in no small part by a pact with Saudi Arabia, the oil kingpin. But the ground, my friends, is shifting. Whispers have turned to headlines. Saudi Arabia is exploring alternatives to the petrodollar agreement. Is this the tremor that precedes an economic earthquake? Picture this, the year is 1973. The world watches, captivated and terrified as conflict erupts in the Middle East, the Yom Kippur War. In the midst of this geopolitical turmoil, a group of nations wielding immense economic power decides to make a statement. This group, known as OPEC, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, flexes its muscles, declaring an oil embargo against nations supporting Israel. Can you imagine the ripple effect? This was no ordinary embargo, my friends. This was a chokehold on the lifeblood of the global economy. The U.S., heavily reliant on foreign oil, felt the squeeze almost immediately. Lines at gas stations snaked for blocks, a stark visual reminder of the nation's vulnerability. The cost of living skyrocketed as businesses grappled with soaring energy prices. The very fabric of American life, built on the promise of cheap and abundant energy, began to unravel. From the ashes of this crisis, a new world order began to emerge. The U.S., desperate to stabilize its economy and secure its energy future, reached out to Saudi Arabia, the crown jewel of OPEC, the undisputed king of oil. A deal was struck. A pact was forged. A pact that would reshape the global financial landscape for decades to come. The terms were deceptively simple. Saudi Arabia, swimming in a sea of black gold, agreed to price its oil exclusively in U.S. dollars. In exchange, the United States would provide the House of Saud with military protection, ensuring the stability of the kingdom and its vast oil reserves. And perhaps even more significantly, this agreement would elevate the U.S. dollar to the status of the world's reserve currency. Think about that for a moment. The U.S. dollar, backed by the promise of Saudi oil, would become the linchpin of global trade, the currency that nations around the world would use to conduct business, to settle debts, to build their reserves. This, my friends, was the birth of the petrodollar system. For decades, the petrodollar system reigned supreme. It was the bedrock of American economic dominance, the engine that powered the global financial system. Nations around the world, hungry for Saudi oil, had no choice but to acquire U.S. dollars. This insatiable demand for dollars propped up the U.S. economy, allowing it to borrow cheaply and live beyond its means. It was, some might argue, a system rigged in America's favor. But even the mightiest of empires can crumble. And cracks, my friends, are beginning to show in the seemingly impenetrable facade of the petrodollar. The world is changing, shifting beneath our feet. The rise of new economic powers, the resurgence of geopolitical rivalries, the relentless march of technology, all are converging to challenge the old order. And leading the charge is none other than China. Yes, that China. The economic powerhouse that has been steadily chipping away at America's dominance for decades. China with its insatiable appetite for energy, is now the world's largest importer of crude oil. And they are no longer content to play by America's rules. Let me paint you a picture. This, my friends, is the nightmare scenario that the doomsayers are peddling. And it's a scenario that has many people understandably worried. But hold on a minute. Let's not hit the panic button just yet. Because on the other side of the ring, you have a more optimistic camp. They see the potential decline of the petrodollar not as a catastrophe but as a natural evolution, a necessary recalibration of a system that's been out of balance for far too long. They argue that the dollar's dominance has bred complacency, arrogance, and a dangerous sense of entitlement in the United States. This shift, they argue, could be the wake-up call America needs a chance to address its structural economic issues, to reduce its reliance on debt, to foster innovation and competitiveness. 
It's a chance, they say, to rebuild the American economy on a more sustainable foundation, one that doesn't rely on the crutch of a global reserve currency. So who's right? Are we headed for a global economic meltdown or a period of adjustment and renewal? The truth, as always, lies somewhere in the nuanced space between these two extremes. It's a complex issue with no easy answers. But one thing's for certain, the road ahead will be bumpy. Let's take a closer look at the potential fallout, shall we? Let's say the doomsayers have it right. Let's say the dollar does falter. What might that look like for everyday Americans? Well, brace yourselves, folks, because it wouldn't be pretty. Imagine walking into your local supermarket, your shopping list in hand, only to be greeted by sticker shock. That gallon of milk you used to buy? Double the price. That new TV you've had your eye on? Forget about it. A weakening dollar would make imported goods, everything from electronics and clothing to food and fuel, significantly more expensive. And it's not just consumer goods that would take a hit. Think about all the things we rely on that come from overseas. Manufacturing components. Raw materials. Even the coffee beans for your morning cup of joe. A weaker dollar would ripple through the entire economy, driving up prices and squeezing household budgets. But the pain wouldn't stop there. Remember those low interest rates we've become accustomed to? the ones that have fueled the housing market and made borrowing relatively painless? Well, those could very well dry up. See, a weaker dollar makes U.S. Treasury bonds, those safe haven assets that foreign investors love, less attractive. And if demand for those bonds drops, interest rates would likely rise to compensate. What does that mean for you? Well, it would become more expensive to take out a mortgage, buy a car, or even use your credit card. Businesses, too, would face higher borrowing costs, potentially stifling investment and job creation. The potential ramifications are far-reaching, my friends, and the impact on the average American could be significant. But let's not forget, this is just one possible scenario. Now, some of you might be thinking, this all sounds pretty bleak. Is there any upside to this potential shift? You'd be right to ask that question, because despite the risks, the decline of the petrodollar doesn't necessarily have to spell doom and gloom. In fact, it could present some intriguing, even exciting opportunities if, and that's a big if, we play our cards right. Let's go back to that idea of a more multipolar world for a moment. Imagine a global economy where no single currency reigns supreme. A world where emerging economies, long relegated to the sidelines, have a seat at the table and a voice in shaping the rules of the game. This, my friends, could be a recipe for greater economic stability in the long run. Think about it. With multiple power centers, the global economy wouldn't be so vulnerable to the actions or inactions of any one nation. If one economy stumbles, others can pick up the slack. If one currency weakens, others can provide stability. It would be a more balanced, resilient system, less prone to the kind of domino effect we saw during the 2008 financial crisis. And it's not just about stability. A more multipolar world could also open up new avenues for growth and development, particularly for countries that have been trapped in a cycle of debt and dependency. Imagine, for instance, a young entrepreneur in Africa armed with a brilliant idea for a new tech startup. In today's dollar-dominated world, they'd face an uphill battle accessing capital and competing on a global stage. But in a world with a more diverse financial system, they might find it easier to secure funding, to partner with businesses in other emerging markets, to bring their innovations to the world without having to jump through countless hoops. This could unleash a wave of entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic empowerment across the developing world. So yes, the road ahead might be bumpy, but it's also a road that could lead to a more just, equitable, and prosperous future for all of us. 
The key, as always, is how we navigate this transition, how we adapt to the changing landscape and seize the opportunities that lie ahead. We humans, we have a tendency to view things in stark terms, don't we? Black and white. Boom or bust. But the reality, as is often the case, is far more nuanced. The decline of empires, of currencies, of dominant systems, these things rarely happen overnight. They're not sudden collapses, but rather slow, drawn-out affairs, marked by periods of adjustment, adaptation, and yes, even resurgence. Think back with me, if you will, to the Roman Empire. For centuries, it stood as the undisputed master of the Mediterranean world, a beacon of power, prosperity, and cultural influence. But its decline, my friends, was not a sudden cataclysm, but a gradual erosion spanning centuries. There were periods of crisis, to be sure, but also periods of renewal, of adaptation, of remarkable resilience. The Roman Empire, in its various forms, endured for over a millennium, leaving an indelible mark on Western civilization. The point I'm trying to make here is this. The dollar, despite the challenges it faces, is unlikely to simply vanish overnight. It remains the world's most traded currency, backed by the world's largest economy and a deep and liquid financial market. It's deeply embedded in the global financial system, and disentangling it will be a complex and protracted process. What we're likely to see is not a sudden death of the dollar, but a gradual evolution of its role. It will continue to be a major player on the global stage, but its dominance, its unquestioned supremacy, will likely fade. We're already seeing signs of this, as nations diversify their reserves, conduct trade in other currencies, and seek alternatives to the dollar-denominated financial system. This transition, this slow-motion evolution, will present both challenges and opportunities. And how we navigate this period of change will determine the shape of the global economy for decades to come. Let's be honest, folks. This isn't just some dry academic discussion about currencies and trade balances. At its heart, this is about power, raw, unadulterated power, the power to shape the global order, to influence the destinies of nations, to dictate the terms of engagement in the international arena. And for decades, my friends, the United States has been holding the reins, thanks in no small part to the petrodollar. Think about it. The ability to print the world's reserve currency has given the U.S. an unparalleled economic advantage. It's allowed the U.S. to run massive trade deficits, to borrow cheaply on a global scale, to finance its military adventures without breaking the bank. Some might even call it an exorbitant privilege, but this privilege comes at a price. It's created resentment, suspicion, and a growing chorus of voices calling for an end to the dollar's dominance. Countries like China, Russia, and Iran, nations that have often chafed under the weight of U.S. sanctions and economic pressure, see the potential decline of the petrodollar as an opportunity to break free from the shackles of American hegemony. And they're not just sitting on the sidelines, folks. They're actively building alternative systems, forging new alliances, and chipping away at the foundations of the dollar-based order. The Belt and Road Initiative, the BRICS Development Bank, the growing use of bilateral currency swaps. These are just a few examples of the ways in which the geopolitical landscape is being redrawn. The potential implications are far-reaching. A shift away from the petrodollar could erode U.S. influence on the world stage, making it more difficult to project power, to enforce sanctions, to shape the global agenda. It could embolden rivals, embolden adversaries, and create a more volatile and unpredictable world. Now, let's zoom in on a specific arena where this power struggle is playing out with particular intensity, the global energy markets. For decades, oil, that viscous black gold, has been the lifeblood of the global economy. And the petrodollar system, as we've discussed, has been the mechanism by which this vital commodity has been traded priced, and financed. But as the tectonic plates of geopolitics shift, so too does the energy landscape. Imagine a world where oil is no longer priced exclusively in U.S. dollars, 
a world where new benchmarks emerge, perhaps denominated in a basket of currencies reflecting the shifting balance of economic power. We're already seeing hints of this future, with China launching its own yuan-denominated oil futures contract, challenging the long-standing dominance of the Brent and WTI benchmarks. Think about the implications. Oil-producing nations no longer beholden to the dollar could have more leverage in negotiations, more flexibility in how they manage their reserves, more options for financing energy projects. This could create new opportunities for economic development, particularly in regions like the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. But it's not just about pricing. This shift away from the petrodollar could also reshape the very alliances that have governed the global energy order for decades. OPEC, once a formidable cartel wielding significant influence over global oil prices, might find its grip loosening as nations pursue their own strategic interests. We're already seeing cracks in the facade, with the UAE recently announcing its intention to leave the group. This fragmentation could lead to greater volatility in the oil markets as supply and demand dynamics become more complex and unpredictable. But it could also foster greater competition, potentially leading to lower prices for consumers in the long run. The key question, as always, is how these various actors, oil producers, consumers, investors, and geopolitical rivals adapt to this rapidly evolving landscape. This brings us back to Saudi Arabia, the kingdom in the desert, the custodian of Islam's holiest sites, and of course, the guardian of the world's second largest oil reserves. Saudi Arabia, my friends, finds itself at a crossroads, facing a momentous decision with potentially global ramifications. For decades, the Saudis have been the linchpin of the petrodollar system. Their commitment to pricing oil in U.S. dollars has been unwavering, a cornerstone of their strategic alliance with the United States. But recent events suggest that this long-standing partnership might be fraying at the edges. Think back to that bombshell announcement a few days ago. Saudi Arabia, for the first time in almost half a century, is openly exploring alternatives to the petrodollar agreement. They're talking to China about pricing some of their oil exports in Yuan. They're strengthening ties with Russia, a nation that has long advocated for a move away from the dollar. Now, the Saudis aren't exactly known for making rash decisions. Their moves on the geopolitical chessboard are calculated, deliberate, and steeped in a long-term strategic vision. So the question is, why now? Why are the Saudis, after all these years, signaling a potential willingness to rock the boat, to potentially upend the very system that has brought them such wealth and influence? The answer, my friends, is complex and multifaceted. It's a tapestry woven from threads of economic pragmatism, geopolitical ambition, and perhaps even a touch of historical resentment. Some analysts, my friends, believe that the Saudis are simply hedging their bets. They argue that the House of Saud, always the shrewd geopolitical players, recognize that the world is shifting towards a multipolar order. The rise of China, the resurgence of Russia, the growing assertiveness of regional powers, all of these trends point towards a future where power is more diffuse, less concentrated in the hands of a single hegemon. In this emerging world order, the Saudis, so the argument goes, are seeking to diversify their alliances to avoid becoming overly reliant on any one partner. They understand that hitching their wagon too closely to a declining U.S., a U.S. increasingly distracted by internal divisions and external challenges, could leave them vulnerable. By engaging with China, with Russia, with other emerging powers, they're signaling their independence, their willingness to play the field, to forge their own path in a rapidly changing world. But there's another, perhaps more intriguing, explanation for Saudi Arabia's recent moves. A growing sense of frustration, even resentment, with U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. Remember the Iran nuclear deal? The agreement that the Obama administration painstakingly negotiated, only to be unceremoniously scrapped by the Trump administration? 
That episode, my friends, sent shockwaves through the region, leaving the Saudis feeling betrayed and exposed. And it wasn't just the Iran deal. The chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the perceived lack of U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's intervention in Yemen, the growing criticism of the kingdom's human rights record from within the U.S. itself, all of these developments have strained the relationship, sown seeds of doubt, and led some in Riyadh to question the reliability of their longtime ally. The petrodollar, in this context, could be seen as a bargaining chip, a lever of influence that the Saudis are willing to use to extract concessions, to reassert their interests, and to ensure that their voices are heard in Washington. Now it's tempting, especially in the realm of international relations, to view everything through the lens of geopolitics. To see every move, every decision, as a calculated maneuver on the global chessboard. But we'd be remiss, my friends, if we ignored the powerful internal forces that are also shaping Saudi Arabia's calculus. Because beneath the headlines about petrodollars and geopolitical alliances, there's a deeper transformation underway within the kingdom itself. Imagine, if you will, a nation grappling with the realization that its vast oil wealth, the very foundation of its economic might, is finite. Imagine a young generation, raised in an era of unprecedented prosperity, facing the prospect of a future where the black gold that has fueled their parents' generation might not be enough. This, my friends, is the challenge the existential dilemma confronting Saudi Arabia today. And to their credit, they're not shying away from it. In fact, they've embarked on an ambitious, some might even say audacious, plan to transform their economy, to wean themselves off their dependence on oil, and to position themselves for a future beyond fossil fuels. They call it Vision 2030. It's a sweeping plan, a blueprint for modernization, encompassing everything from diversifying the economy and investing in renewable energy to promoting tourism and empowering women. It's about transforming Saudi Arabia from an oil-dependent kingdom into a global investment powerhouse, a hub for technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Now you might be thinking, what does this internal Saudi Arabian restructuring have to do with the petrodollar? And that's a fair question. But here's the crucial connection. Vision 2030, at its core, is about reducing Saudi Arabia's dependence on oil revenues. It's about creating a more diversified economy, one that's less susceptible to the boom and bust cycles of the global energy markets. And what better way to hedge against the decline of oil than to diversify your currency holdings? By exploring alternatives to the petrodollar, by embracing currencies like the yuan and the euro, Saudi Arabia is essentially taking out an insurance policy, a safeguard against a future where oil might no longer be the kingmaker it once was. This internal push for diversification, my friends, aligns perfectly with a larger global trend, the inevitable, albeit gradual, transition towards renewable energy. Solar, wind, geothermal, hydrogen, these clean energy sources are no longer the stuff of science fiction. They're rapidly becoming cheaper, more efficient, and more accessible, driving a global energy revolution that has the potential to reshape the world as we know it. And as this energy transition gains momentum, the importance of oil, and by extension the petrodollar, will inevitably diminish. It's not a question of if, my friends, but when. The writing is on the wall, and the Saudis, to their credit, seem to be reading it loud and clear. So after this whirlwind tour of geopolitics, economics, and Saudi Arabian ambition, let's come back to our original question. Are we witnessing the end of the petrodollar system as we know it? Is the mighty dollar, the bedrock of the global financial order for over half a century, destined for the dustbin of history? Well, allow me to offer a slightly more nuanced perspective. See, the petrodollar system despite its seeming complexity, is really just a set of agreements, a network of relationships built on a foundation of shared interests. For decades, those interests, 
America's desire for global dominance, Saudi Arabia's need for security, the world's insatiable thirst for oil, were aligned creating a system that, while not without its flaws, functioned relatively smoothly. But the ground, my friends, is shifting. The old certainties are crumbling. The interests that once seemed so perfectly aligned are beginning to diverge. The U.S., while still a formidable power, is no longer the unchallenged hegemon it once was. Saudi Arabia, emboldened and seeking its own path, is no longer content to be merely a client state. And the world, my friends, well, the world is waking up to the reality that its future doesn't have to be dictated by the whims of a few powerful nations. So, is this the end of the petrodollar? Perhaps. But it's more likely a slow and complex evolution rather than an abrupt collapse. The dollar, due to its sheer size and inertia, will remain a major player in the global financial system for years, even decades to come. But its dominance, its unquestioned supremacy, is being challenged, chipped away at by forces both visible and unseen. We stand, my friends, at the cusp of a new era, an era marked by uncertainty, by flux, by a profound reshaping of the global power balance. The old order, the order that was built on the back of the petrodollar, on American hegemony, on the unquestioned dominance of fossil fuels, is giving way to something new. Something different. Something, dare I say, potentially more equitable, more just, more reflective of the aspirations of the many, not just the privileged few. But this transition, like all transitions, will be fraught with risk. As the old order crumbles, as the tectonic plates of geopolitics grind against each other, we can expect turbulence, volatility, perhaps even conflict. It's a dangerous time, my friends, a time for prudence, for wisdom, for bold leadership. The key to navigating this perilous landscape lies in adaptation, in embracing change, not fearing it in recognizing that the world is not a zero-sum game where one nation's gain must necessarily come at another's expense. We need to move beyond the outdated paradigms of the past, the dog-eat-dog -dog mentality that has led to so much conflict and suffering. We need to recognize, my friends, that we are all in this together, that our destinies are intertwined, our fates interconnected, the challenges we face, climate change, economic inequality, geopolitical instability, these are not challenges that any one nation, however powerful, can solve alone. They demand cooperation, collaboration, a willingness to find common ground, to build bridges instead of walls. We live, my friends, in an age of unprecedented interconnectedness. The internet, that vast digital web, has woven together the fabric of our lives shrinking distances, blurring borders, and connecting us in ways that were unimaginable just a generation ago. And ideas, capital, information, these flow across borders at the speed of light, defying the old constraints of geography and political ideology. But this interconnectedness, while brimming with potential, also carries with it inherent dangers. Just as a virus can spread across the globe in a matter of days, so too can economic shocks, political upheavals, and social unrest. We're all vulnerable, my friends, to the ripples of instability that emanate from even the most distant corners of the world. This, then, is the defining paradox of our time. Our interconnectedness has made us both more interdependent and more vulnerable. It's given us the tools to build a more prosperous and equitable world, but it's also amplified the consequences of our failures. Navigating this complex landscape demands a fundamental shift in mindset. It requires us to move beyond the narrow confines of national self-interest to embrace a more expansive, more enlightened view of our place in the world. It's about recognizing that our collective fate, for better or worse, is inexorably linked. The potential decline of the petrodollar, my friends, is more than just an economic event. It's a symptom a manifestation of a much deeper transformation underway in the world. A transformation that's upending old hierarchies, challenging established power structures, and redefining what it means to be a global player in the 21st century. 
We're moving away from a world dominated by a single superpower, a world where the rules of the game were set by a select few. We're moving towards a world that is more multipolar, more decentralized, more representative of the diversity and dynamism of the global community. A world where power is no longer a zero-sum game, where cooperation and collaboration are not just ideals, but necessities. This transition, like all transitions, will be messy. It will be marked by periods of uncertainty, of instability, perhaps even of conflict. But it also presents an opportunity, an opportunity to create a more just, equitable, and sustainable world order. The question is, will we seize this opportunity? Will we rise to the challenge of our time? Or will we cling to the outdated paradigms of the past, to the zero-sum mentality that has brought us to this precipice? The answer, my friends, lies not in the stars, but in ourselves. It's easy, amidst the constant barrage of headlines, the relentless churn of the 24-hour news cycle, to feel overwhelmed, to feel like we're just passive observers swept along by forces beyond our control. But let me remind you, my friends, that history is not some preordained script, some inevitable march of progress or decline. It is a story that we write, each and every one of us, through our actions, our choices, our willingness to engage in the great debates of our time. This story of the petrodollar, of the shifting sands of global finance, of the reordering of the world order, this is not just some abstract geopolitical drama playing out on some distant stage. It has real-world consequences. It affects our jobs, our livelihoods, our security, our very future. And that means, my friends, that we have a stake in how this story unfolds. We can choose to be passive observers, content to watch from the sidelines as the world transforms around us. Or we can choose to be active participants, to engage in the public discourse, to hold our leaders accountable, to demand a future that reflects our values and aspirations. The choice, my friends, is ours. The world is watching. It's watching to see how this grand drama of the petrodollar unfolds. It's watching to see whether the United States, the architect of the post-war global order, can adapt to a world where power is more diffuse, less absolute. It's watching to see if Saudi Arabia, the once and future king of oil, can navigate the treacherous currents of geopolitics and emerge stronger, more independent, more prosperous. And perhaps most importantly, my friends, the world is watching to see if we, the global community, can, ri can rise to the challenge of this moment. Can we forge a new global compact, one that is more equitable, more just, more sustainable than the one that has guided us for the past half century? Can we transcend the narrow confines of national self-interest and embrace a more expansive, more enlightened view of our shared destiny? These are not easy questions. They are the defining questions of our time. And the answers, my friends, will determine the course of human history for generations to come. Will this transition be smooth or tumultuous? Will it usher in an era of greater cooperation or greater conflict? Will it lead to greater instability or a more equitable world order? The answer, my friends, depends on the choices that we make the actions that we take, the future that we choose to create. The potential demise of the petrodollar is a story that is still being written. It's a story of shifting alliances, of economic upheaval, of geopolitical maneuvering. But above all, my friends, it's a story about choice. Our choice. We have a choice, my friends, to cling to the familiar comforts of the old order, to the illusions of control and dominance, even as the world transforms around us. Or we can choose to embrace the uncertainty of this moment, to lean into the headwinds of change, to help shape a future that is more just, more equitable, and more sustainable for all. This is not a time for complacency, my friends. It's not a time for apathy or resignation. It's a time for courage, for vision, for bold and decisive action. The future, like a blank canvas, awaits our brushstrokes. The story of the 21st century, the story of our interconnected world, is ours to write. 
Let's make it a story worth telling.